We got a deal, you fucking animal! Oh, dude, did you fuck this bread? You fuck the shit out of this bread? You don't fuck bread, God? I had me a Welcome to my future husband's Facebook episode 7. Holy crap. As Sarah has just told me through the use of her hands. Would you rather my toes? Well, that would be a little bit harder to see, so... You know, I'm thankful for the hands. Okay. Less monkey-like as well. Thank you. You know how those monkeys are. But anyways, yeah, so seven episodes in. Doing stuff. How do you feel? I don't know. <laughs> Obtuse? Obtuse? About it? Obtuse. I don't know, I like doing it, so... Yeah. Glad we keep doing it. Uh, and we've been more consistent, so that's always a positive. Yay! Yay! At least one a week, including our other things. If you haven't checked them out, we are doing a Ultimate Watchmen discussion <laughs> series. So it's going to be like a limited series podcast that is meant to be a companion piece to articles Sarah is writing on the blog. So yep. if you check out uh, www.mfhbff.wordpress.com, Go and check them out and read them for yourself, and then listen to the podcast. What an excellent plug. I know. What it is an excellent plug. It's very self-serving. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, anyways, having a lot of fun doing that, so we've been doing a lot of that kind of stuff. A lot more writing, you know. But we, you know, have been still watching movies and television shows and stuff like that. Hence this. Hence what we're doing now. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, um, so before we get into the meat of this podcast, I guess we're going to go into what I'm going to start calling... The stream zone. Wow. That is what Did the you segment just think is, of that? Yeah, that's what the segment is going to be called. <laughs> okay. The stream zone. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Streaming. So, yeah, we're going to. This is the. Welcome to the stream zone. Uh, we're going to make some recommendations or talk about more or less what we've been, been watching. watching on Netflix. That's really what it is. <laughs> Netflix, because that's the only streaming service we have right now. I've, I had Hulu and I tried out Amazon. Amazon Plus or whatever the hell it's called. Yeah, that was it was all right. Premium that premium Amazon service. I mean, it's a lot of the same stuff that's on uh, Netflix. There are a few. There's a few other like awesome things. I actually, was thinking about because you can get the 30 day free trial. That's why I tried it. Amazon Prime. That's what it's called. Yeah, Amazon Prime. Yeah, and, sounds um, like a transformer. I was like thinking. Did it. <laughs> I was thinking that maybe you should go on your account and do it. <laughs> Sure. Sign up for the 30-day free trial so we could maybe... There's a couple shows in there I'd like to actually watch. As long watch. as we discontinue it before they start yeah, raving you can, my account. you can do it right away. Um, so, which is nice. I'm, it's actually surprising that they allow you to, like, disconnect before your, like, time is out. So you can just sign up for the 30-day free trial. And use it for a day. Get it through your TV. Use it. And right away... Like, go to the deactivation thing, and it's still on for 30 days. It just doesn't automatically charge you at the end of it. That's what oh. I did, yeah. Yeah, it was That's pretty cool, because most of them make you, like, wait until the very end. Right, um, and then you usually forget. Although Hulu Plus, I think, has got a similar setup. I didn't. I don't really know much about Hulu Plus. Because one time I tried Hulu Plus for, like, the seven-day trial period, forgot, Ooh. and then had it for a month. And Hulu Plus, eh, I don't know. Like, you gotta pay for it, and then you still have to watch advertisements, like... Oh, yeah, the that's... My friend had that. And the movies and all that stuff. Yeah, my friend had it, and we I didn't ever have it, but it was, like... The one cool thing about it, though, it's is... It's like, I'm paying for this. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, why do I, The cool thing about it, like, most of the movies, though, aren't commercial-free, and they have access to a good amount of the Criterion Collection. Yeah. Most of the... Cri there's a, a huge chunk of the Criterion Collection is on Hulu+. Plus. Okay. So that was cool. That's like that was cool. I w ended up watching a couple old old movies I'd never seen. A couple I had seen not in a while. Like I watched the original Blob, I think, because that's a, that's a Criterion movie. Yeah. Um. So that was cool. But anyways, continuing on. Yeah. So Netflix. What have you been watching, sir? I'm gonna be completely honest. I've been watching Bridezilla's. Mm, yes, she has. I Which think is I good just... for me because I've been getting a lot of reading done. So. Yeah. Well, no. I just thought it was funny because we're gonna be getting married. In yeah, a year. we're getting so, married next next October, October yeah. 2014. And I just thought it'd be funny to watch a show like that, 
because it's hilarious. I mean, it, it gets kind of grating after, uh, like, I would say three episodes in a row. Oh, because it's so... Because they're all whiny yeah. bitches. <laughs> and the seasons, to note, like, the seasons on Netflix are the later seasons. Yeah. So, like, their formula is super set in stone. And there's probably... I, I asked you this question when, while you are watching it. Like, how much do you think of this is a put-on just because they know they're on a show called Bradzilla's? I think that it's a, a good mixture. But then, like, the one I was just watching before we decided to do the podcast, like, it wasn't really the bride. The bride just cries at everything, so they were calling her Cryzilla. It was the mom. Yeah. The mom was being, like, fucking... Super domineering and stuff. Domineering and, like, even, like, over hair dye colors. That, yeah. Like, her daughter wanted, like, black hair for the wedding, and her mom was like, it makes you look gothic and sick and, like, yeah. just upsetting, and she, like, refused to pay for her daughter's hair dye because of that. It was really funny. And then she was like, I maybe overreacted a little bit. It looks fine. Well, but she still has to pay for it, so if she doesn't like it, then I guess... No, I under- no, I understand that, but right. I'm saying that's what happened. Yeah. I don't know. So, it's, it's really funny because, you know, we're not gonna have a huge to-do when we get married, yeah. but it's funny to see, like, these girls, like, throwing hissy fits while their families are putting out like twenty thousand dollars oh my god they spend so much money on these things and a lot of the people on that show are not like super wealthy i mean they try to put off the air that they are but they're not but they're not it's just like spoiled kids basically yeah like demanding they get these extravagant things because it's their special day and stuff which of course it is a special day it's a special event but like it doesn't gotta be i don't know make compromises you gotta be understanding and you gotta like have awareness of yeah, reality. Yeah, like, one girl freaking out about, like, someone not putting a caramel apple in a bag, right? Like, she's calling her fiancé an idiot because, like, well, he couldn't... Well, yeah, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just, like, little things like that, and then, like, telling them to retie these tags because the bows don't look right, and yeah. they had, like, 160 of them to do. The most fascinating thing I find about that show is the idea that people would voluntarily sign up for it. I mean, I guess there is this obsession with, like, this is their chance, that 15 minutes of fame, fame. Yeah. thing, like, oh, because people will just agree to anything if they're put on television, like, you know, so, like, because the conceit of it, like, they know what it is, they know it's not going to paint them in a very positive, positive light, way. but wonder, I wonder, like, if in the back of their minds they think they're going to, like, prove the conceit wrong or something, like, that they're going to show... That was that, justified that in the end? Yeah, that they're just, that, like, they're not the ones that are crazy... But they are. They are. I mean, part of that could be editing. I mean, there's so many things that go into the production of those shows. But, I mean, even... There's certain things that you that are very clearly edited, like the off-camera voices and stuff, and then somebody re- the reactions are so, like, fucking cut. My favorite was the one where they ended up after, during the reception, breaking up. Mm. And then they got an annulment. <laughs> no, but what I, what I mean is just, like, it's just... There's a, a, a huge level of artifice in that show. Yeah. Well, but that's what's with a wedding. <laughs> but then there's also things that you can't deny. Like there is context for it that they actually show, as far as like you know the ridiculousness of some of their attitudes and stuff like that. There's no way they don't have to like artificially create those, some of those scenarios. Right. They artificially create a lot of the overblown reaction to it. Like something somebody says makes it seem a lot more dramatic than it really is, and blah blah blah. I mean, it's just. Reality I know. Television 101 reality, at this point. No, I know, but I just, I thought it was funny to watch a show like that, considering, like, we're kind of planning a wedding right now, so. Yeah. And I keep threatening to be one, but I'm not, because we're not going to be doing anything extravagant, really, no, so. No, no. <laughs> we're going to have the best, funnest wedding ever. Hell yeah. <laughs> because we're too laid back to care care that much about. I don't care about ribbon. A stupid thing like that. Like, no, yeah. yeah. So, let's see. Still watching Cheers, too, because there's like 8 million episodes. Yeah, still watching Cheers. I'm trying to think, what have we watched on Netflix? Not much. We haven't really watched too much Netflix, actually, lately. We've been watching movies. Outside of, like, what we were already watching before, like, right. we're just continuing watching the same things. I'm trying to think of, like, a recommendation from Netflix I can make. I don't know. The Thing is on Netflix, you could always watch that. I recommend it. I found it. Well, actually, it. maybe that might not be on there anymore. That yeah. might be incorrect. Oh, you don't even know. No, it's on there. It's on there. You just search John Carpenter. Do not watch John Carpenter's The Ward. This is the latest movie he made. That's a terrible movie. Oh. It just had me like, you know, I guess, you know, you get old. You <laughs> aren't good forever. Um, so, yeah. Ouch. Zing. Adds a little bit more, like, veracity to the argument of Quentin Tarantino wanting to retire before he becomes an old man director. Makes, Which, it makes me kind of like... the Some of my favorite directors are from like the 80s, like David Cronenberg, John Carpenter. Like I really have a great affinity for those directors in their early movies. But like the older they get, there is like this loss of edge. Yeah. Um, that is just... Because I guess you're just old. 
Like you just get older, you just get tired, you just don't care as much. Like there's no that fire that was inside you to create that kind of art is just not there anymore. Right. So I guess it makes sense. It makes yeah. sense. So maybe some people are better off just quitting while they're ahead. And maybe Tarantino will just keep producing or like bringing over movies. Probably do that, and he says he wants to write, like do film, long form film criticism, stuff like that. Things he's not able to do as a director because he doesn't Have feel like it's right for him to be criticizing other people like yeah. to that depth while working in the medium. Yeah, so that's once fair. he separates himself from it, like he'll be able to kind of reinvent himself as more of a writer. So I can I can respect that. And supporter of Wu Wear. And <laughs> supporter yeah, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the press junkets for Django Unchained where got pretty silly. Wearing the Sam Jackson Kangol hat, you know? Mm-hmm. He is Sam Jackson now. It's all about continuity of presence, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so I guess It's like that's... I'm making a movie that's uh riff on black exploitation movies and so I'm going to dress in Fubu wear and stuff. It's funny, like he should have he should have been, like, half cowboy, half, you know, like, gangsta. If he, wanted to, <laughs> if he really wanted to sell it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or just wore the uh, first outfit that Django wears, that, like, blue ruffly outfit. That would have, see, that would have been awesome. I if he did the press tour like that, that would have been awesome. Yes. Like, that's all of them dressed in that that's fancy some, That's something I would do. Yeah, you probably would. I would. I'd do that. Well, I'd do that. I'm just going to the store, so. Yeah, you would. I don't really care. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess that's really it for Netflix this week. Yeah. Because we've been watching more movies and kind of doing stuff as opposed to watching Netflix. Yeah. It's which to... I, I kind of feel good about for a change. No, it's nice because there's like, you know, you get into like a rut of just watching. And the thing about Netflix, we've discussed this before, is like you watch so much shit on there. Like there's, Bridezilla's. Like Bridezilla's. There's so many good things on there um, that it just makes me like, why am I not like, I have the access to these like, fantastic films and I don't watch them. Right. Like I, you know, and it's part of it is also we sh- I share a Netflix account with uh, the rest of my family, which causes some distress sometimes because you can only have two of them on at the same time. Right. But, um, <laughs> and like a lot of my recommendations are based on, they watch it a lot more than I do, so a lot of the recommendations I get are based on things they watch. And then they rate things and that we watch. And they rate things like fucking super low that I would rate high and stuff like that. Sometimes they'll just be fuckers and sometimes because they're just, I don't know, entitled children. Oh, don't be nice. I'm joking. It's a joke, folks. (laughs) It's a joke. Yeah, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, we got three movies to talk about today. We're going... Some pretty good ones, actually. Yeah, actually, all pretty good. Um, We'll go in the order of depth that we're going to go into them, I suppose. Yep. Uh, So... If you see the title, you probably know. Uh, we saw The Conjuring, mm-hmm. Only God Forgives, and there's a new documentary, The Act of Killing. Um, I wrote a review for The Conjuring. It's on the site, so if you want to like read... What's like, that website again? My future... Oh, mfhbff.wordpress.com <laughs> such a, I'm such an... I'm not one for branding. Um... But, like, anyways, there's a review for it on the site. It go into some more depth of criticism and stuff like that. We'll probably just kind of briefly touch on it on here. Um, but, so, The Conjuring, we saw it last weekend? Uh, what do you think of it? What I think of it? Yeah. I thought it was all right. You know, I'm starting to watch scary movies more, or quote-unquote scary yeah, yeah. horror movies since we've been together. Mm-hmm. I was never one growing up to really watch them. Yeah. So, getting more into it as I get older, I suppose. Which, they were, like, big around my house. Like, my mom and my uncle. Yeah. But, um, I enjoyed it, though. Um, it's the same director did Insidious, which you made me watch. You didn't make me watch. I yeah. asked to watch. James Wan, yeah. Yeah, James Wan. Creator of Saw. That was where you got to start, actually. Yeah, which the first Saw was okay. It was okay, yeah. Poor Man 7. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... I, because I, I saw the trailer for Insidious 2 first, and I went back and asked you about it because my friend that I was with was really excited about it. Yeah. So we went and we watched it, and I really enjoyed Insidious. Mm-hmm. And so then we decided to go see The Conjuring. We went with your sister. Yeah, and it had gotten really good notices as being like kind of a, a, a true, quote unquote, true horror film, and that it was kind of a back to, back to essentials type style. And it kind was. Kind of reminiscent of like 70s horror, haunted house movies. And it was. And it totally was. It, and it's a very faithful... And fantastic costumes. Yeah, fantastic, because it's a period. It's a period 
piece in the 70s. That's so weird to say that 70s mo- like a movie set in the 70s is, is a, a period, period piece. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is. It's a period piece. That's so um, long ago. Based on a maybe allegedly true story of uh, from the case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren. Yeah. Some well-known paranormal investigators. They've been around since the 50s actually. Demonologist. Demonologist and a psychic. Ed is a demonologist, Lorraine being the psychic. Yep. I see dead people and all that good stuff. And I guess we should mention their most famous case was the... Amityville Horror. Right. Which is actually kind of what discredited them a lot. Discredited them a lot. Especially as the years have gone on and like kind of the more that's revealed about that, the more kind of transparent the, transparent the hoax is. Yeah. Like, uh, there actually is another pretty decent documentary. It's called My Amityville Horror. It's about... Um, we watched that, right? Yeah. It's about the son. Yeah. The son of the family that was, uh, you know, haunted at Amityville. And, um, and it kind of shows more that, like, okay, they are able to explain a lot. I don't think the movie takes a, a hard-edged, like, opinion on the matter. But from what you can see from this, this guy, uh, former child... <laughs> is that when he was a kid, the experiences he had where he was more just like terrorized and he's got a lot of psychological problems because of it, because of, I think, I think his stepfather must just, and like kind of just created the story and would terrorize his kids with it yeah. and then found a way to market it and kind of sell his story, make a living off of it. Right. I mean, two years after the fact, there was the first, that's when the first movie was made. And I think there was like a movie of the week even before that. Probably. Uh, so, you know... It if was, I had a haunted house, I'd do the same thing. So they've been kind of discredited, so I guess the veracity of whether this is true, like based on true events or not is highly subject. I mean, there is actually uh, the family, the, the real family, that um, is afflicted by this by this haunting in the, in the movie The Conjuring. I wrote their own like book about it, and there's even, like, I think they're making their own documentary about it, like the true story behind The Conjuring type thing. Probably yeah. It'll probably show up on, like, the DVD special features or whatever. Right. Um, I know, but I liked I thought the the acting was really good. Even the children did really well in Actually, it. I think the children are the, probably the real standouts, actually. Yeah. Like, a couple of the actresses, the young act- actresses, really kind of sell the terror and sell, like, remind you what it's like, like to be... Like the one with the short brown hair? Yeah. Remind you what yeah. it's like to be a little kid staring into the dark and wondering if something's there. You know what I mean? Like that's the 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 sense of that is like really well put across. Yeah, you a really good job. Because that was that. actually the only time I jumped was when one of the kids like something happened but wasn't really happening. It wasn't like I was supposed to be a super scary part, but one of the kids like jumped and I jumped. Yeah. But that that was awesome. Like you know. Yeah. It was like an accidental jump, and I yeah. felt like an idiot. And nothing was happening. And even, <laughs> even though I think it's like a pretty methodically slow paced movie. It yeah. doles out its information pretty slowly, and nothing feels rushed up until probably the last act of the movie is where it kind of starts Which falling apart. Which is kind apart. of the same with Insidious. It's kind of the same way with Insidious. Like, that was... It, it's super straightforward and stuff like that, but it's never... I was never bored. No, and I, like we've said before in these, I my attention sometimes wanders really quickly, and I usually... I have to be in a certain mood to watch a slow-paced movie. Yeah. I was fine. Yeah, yeah. It moves along quick. It's like so many things happen that, like, I guess the it does have a decent pace. It moves at a good clip, but when it, when it, it slows down for the important parts. And, that, and I didn't feel the dialogue was ever super cheesy. No, 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 no. So I was just like, you know, which is sometimes a thing with horror movies, you yeah. know. But so I kind of like, if there wasn't a ton going on, it was enough to keep me listening to what they were saying. Yeah. I mean, I guess for my, like, overall thought of it is that like it's it's super straightforward which is refreshing but at the same time it could have they could have done some more complex things with it I suppose as far as just like I kind of would have liked it like if it was uncertain whether or not they were actually being haunted for a while and let being used as a reveal like maybe towards the last like third of the movie or something That's, yeah that they because you know like have like because from the get-go it is very clear like no this is real we're being haunted yeah. There's no question about it, you know what I mean? So it kind of would have been a little bit more interesting if there was kind of more of a quote-unquote investigation into it. Yeah. Um, but that's, like, it's not what they were going for. And that's just more of, like, a personal personal opinion about it. Like, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't need to be that way at all. Actually, if you want something like that, there's a really great movie, um, or a movie that I, I enjoy a lot, is uh, The Last Exorcism. Is yeah, you were like, talking about that. I haven't seen that yet. It's pretty good. Very 
we'll have to add it to the queue. Very, it's a character. It's like more of a character piece. I like. But it. yeah, so everything's pretty successful in this movie. Yep. I mean, I wasn't blown away, but I think a lot of that has to do with now I know James Wan's kind of wheelhouse. I know what he's working with, kind of. His wheelhouse? Is he a sailor? <laughs> yes. <laughs> a sailor of the horrible horrorsies. A sailor of terror. Like, so, because, like, Insidious, I actually was creeped out by. Like, I found that to be kind of a creepy... Did you see it in theaters first? No, I didn't, actually. I saw oh. it when it came out on DVD. Because um, I didn't know. Like, right. the idea of, like, a movie from the creator of Saw did not, like... Excite you. Excite me all that much. Not because I hate Saw, uh, at least the first one. Like, I don't hate it or anything, but, like, it doesn't blow, it didn't, doesn't blow my mind. Um, it's no seven. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, because that's why I grew... I saw seven before I saw Saw. Like, I grew up watching Huss. movies that were... That saw is very derivative of. So none of it was very new or revelatory to me. Like it was, it was still, to some people. It was still like kind of fascinating when it first came out, though. I saw it in theaters when Saw came out, and I remember yeah, so being, I, yeah. Yeah, and I remember being like, yeah. But just that first one, though. Yeah. So I think like maybe the awareness of, of how he was going to set up scares. Yeah. Lessened its impact. And if I hadn't seen Insidious, maybe it would have been more effective on me. Maybe. But I don't know. People seem to be going with it those people are really liking it they're calling it the best horror film since The Exorcist which I think is a fair comparison it has a lot in common with The Exorcist yep. in pace and style uh, it's very much a throwback movie to like the 70s era haunted house which movie. I think is good it does justice for the story it's you know it's set in the 70s so yeah. to kind of like mimic the style yeah the filmmaking style of the time actually That's makes a lot of sense, sense. it works it's instead very... of yeah instead of like a modern yeah. 70s story I yeah. don't know if that makes any sense it's, but... it's extremely cohesive like yeah. it's it's very well thought out cohesive like filmmaking and storytelling. Uh, the one thing I did, as far as character perspective, had kind of a problem with is like, like the subplot with the Warrens and their child is really undercooked and kind of isn't... doesn't even have like any kind of... Hold. <laughs> hold at the end. It kind of just drops it. Yep. And doesn't really delve into it too far. And it kind of makes... I feel like it's probably a victim of editing and it's probably... was there's pro probably was more in the movie that further kind of explored the themes... Their family dynamics and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, probably. But, um, maybe we'll find out the director's cut. Maybe, yeah. Maybe there'll be deleted scenes or something. I don't expect him to do a director's cut. I don't I, think he that does was, well, that's what cuts. I meant. Well, that's what I meant, though, is... Yeah, we'll find out, maybe, with the DVDs or the Blu-rays. Maybe. Maybe. But yeah, so overall, I'd recommend it. Mm -hmm. At least a rental. I don't know if I'd necessarily go see it in the theater. I, I kind of thought some of the sound was effective in the theater, though. It's true, yeah, because it is kind of more of a full immersive experience with the speakers. Yeah, we sat kind of closer to the screen than we normally did, and I liked that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it worked, it worked really well. Boom. Um, so, the other movie we watched is uh, Nicholas Winding Refn's Only God Forgives, his second collaboration with Mr. Ryan Gosling. Ryan Gosling, mm. Sarah's favorite. Um, <laughs> it started in irony, and now it's not. <laughs> I think he's actually becoming a pretty good actor. I do too. And I think this movie is a good example of of using him correctly. In the same way I thought... Are we going to spoiler this movie? Yeah, we, we're, this is going to be spoilers. I just... Because I wanted to talk about some things, but I didn't want to give away too... Yeah, we'll spoiler the shit out of this movie. Okay. So... Well, the oh, first wait, wait, spoiler... For, first, first, let's just give our general opinions before we get to spoiler territory. Okay. What did you think of it? Besides Ryan Gosling being hot? Yeah. I thought it was really good. Yeah, me too. And this movie has been super, even more split. It's not, not it's not a fifty fifty like split. It's like, like I think it only has like on Rotten Tomatoes. If you look, it's like thirty four percent freshness. Really? Yeah, people hated this movie. I think it got booed at Cannes. Like huh. I don't, I don't understand why. Like it's, maybe it's a little too on the nose for some people. It is a little clunky as far as like subtext. Like it's with like it's some of, some of the imagery is a little throws you off too sometimes I think. But well, we'll get into that when we get into the spoilers. No, so but I'm just that, that's, that's, that I was being general. I, I'm sorry. Whoa, still your role. <laughs> no, it, it has like a very dreamlike surreal quality throughout the movie that's persistent throughout the movie, and it deals with like family loyalty. Um, the what is what am I looking for? I don't know. I'm not in your brain. Context of justice, like the. Uh, the something of morality. <laughs> like how perspective affects your moral foundations and stuff like that. It's the yeah, relativity I'm, of, of justice and morality. That's the word. Ooh. Relativity is the word I'm looking for. But yeah, so, and I and I think it's pretty successful. It's very straightforward. It's really short. It's under, it's like 89 minutes long. Yeah, it 
Held me. Held me. It's slow, though. Liked it better than it's, Drive. It's slow. It feels like... It feels longer than it probably is. And I think a lot of that has to do with just the way the story is told. It's super fucking... It's glacially slow at points. Yep. Where that movie takes spends a long time with the beautiful camera shots, like, following people really walking. It was a really pretty and, movie. Yeah. every The cinematography is fantastic. Like, every shot is framed like a painting. And, yeah, pretty colors. Yeah. And there's a lot of long takes. There's not a lot of, like, cutting. Nope. It's a lot of, like, very, very... Just, like, things are played out in really long takes. Um... But I think it's effective because it's supposed to like bring you into their mindset, right? Right. So it works. I think overall it's worth your time. I Especially agree. if you can rent it. Uh, it's a video on demand right now and in small run in theaters. I think I mean it's like eight bucks. Uh, so it's it's like you know the price of a movie ticket basically, but you only have to pay for it once yeah. and not have to buy multiple tickets. Uh, so I would I'd give it a recommend if you're interested. If you like Drive and you've liked uh, Nicholas Winding Refn's other movies like Bronson and Valhalla Rising it's got the most in common with Valhalla Rising uh, I would say check it out no it's funny I didn't like Drive too much yeah that's right you were not you're not a I have to rewatch it yeah but I don't know I like this one I haven't seen his other films I'd like to see Bronson Bronson's fantastic this is his most like I'd say like it's most like Valhalla Rising which is this weird like kind of in the same pace very similarly a lot of beautiful imagery and stuff like that of like this Viking brutality. Yeah, you've told me about it. And and I've just never watched it. It's really surreal, trippy, and strange, and kind of has no point. That movie's kind of pointless, though. Um, but those are, like, I guess, art house films. Yeah. Like, as far as you could consider, like, his other movies. Because before that, he had this pretty straightforward, like, crime trilogy called uh, Pusher, about, like, kind of drug dealers and stuff like that. Um, and that's also, they're really, really fantastic. But anyway, so let's open up the spoiler territory, sir. So we're spoiling things as of right now. now. Well, I don't know where I want to start. What do you think about the mom? I think she's uh, a good character. Do you know what I? Do you know what I thought about her? What? Norma Bates. Yeah, a little bit like Norma Bates, which coincidentally is played by Vera Farmiga in Bates Motel, yeah. who also was in The Conjuring. Yeah. There you go. No, but, uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Except more domineering in a um, menacing way. Yeah. Uh, like, it's more malevolent. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like... Because I even mean the re- the special relationship, quote-unquote. <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's basically pretty strongly implied that she has an incestuous relationship with her both of her sons. Poor and, Julian. Uh, she kind of... Uh, what is it? Kind of, like, puts puts her... Her oldest son, the one that gets murdered, or dies, or murdered, uh, yeah, I guess murdered. Yeah, he was murdered. In up on a, like, some type of pedestal, he's almost, like, deified puts him. That puts that D- Puts him at, like, legendary puts status. Puts that D on a pedestal. Yeah. <laughs> literally, at one point. Yeah. Literally. Talks about his wang. Talks about her kid's wangs and how Julian's dick was huge, and Ryan no. Gosling's dick. No, Ryan Gosling was Julian. Oh, sorry. What's the other name? I don't remember the other brother's name. Okay. Julian. Julian's, Julian's penis is big, but not as big as the bigger brothers, the older brothers. They're both very nice. <laughs> yeah, they're both very nice, don't get me wrong. Ugh. But, uh, yeah, so there's, like, and that's kind of present. It's very Freudian. Like, it's, yeah. and, and, like, very obviously Freudian. Like, it's so fucking obvious. Like, I don't understand how somebody could watch this that has any awareness of the outside world or anything and not, like, pick up, like, what the themes are of this movie. Yeah. Well, as far as his character themes, his arc that he goes on about kind of this tortured, wanting, tortured by wanting acceptance from his mother, but also at the same time being repulsed by her, had a similar relationship with his brother that's kind of implied. Uh, she, like, the mother frames it as, like, he's jealous, when he frames it as, like, I don't think that's kind of, I don't think he was jealous. Yeah, I don't think he was either. No. But his mother kind of just puts that on him, imposes that, like, kind of idea in his, on his psyche. He's a dangerous boy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, what do you think about, like, the dream imagery and stuff like that? Because the movie would go in and out of without really telling alerting you. you, except you'd have to pay attention to what people were wearing. Yeah. That's what, like, he had, would have different colored shirts on while he's, like, basically watching, imagines himself watching himself, like, uh, touching girls and stuff like that. But he's not. He's but completely, he's not. like you said, neutered by women. Yeah, he's neutered by women. Like, so if you take, like, this incestuous relationship that he had, 
him and his brother had it with his mother. Like his brother turned into like a crazy, violent misogynist. Uh, Ryan Gosling went totally the other way and is like totally neutered and like does not know what to do. Sort of like socially immature, underdeveloped. Yeah. Like in certain ways, like kind of a simple, For the extremes of it. A simple guy. Um, yeah, I don't know. I thought the uh, and I thought like the message of justice was really interesting between character and character. Oh yeah, because they have like the the cop. The Taiwanese cop, who's fantastic in this movie. I don't know the actor's name, but he was really awesome. I loved his karaoke. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Just another another thing. We'll t maybe we'll talk about in a second here. But like his character is awesome. But the guy is, well, I mean, as his performance is awesome. But he's kind of detestable in his own way. Yeah. Uh, he, Everyone. His movie sense is. of morality and justice is. It's connected to the Freudian thing of like I guess uh, parents and their and their kids. Yeah. Because, like, the reason why he is the way he is is because he has a daughter. Yeah. And so he's into, like, old-fashioned punishment, almost like... Almost like Hammurabi, the, almost. Yeah. Eye for an eye. Eye for an eye. Like, very samurai-esque, even to the point where he carries around a, a samurai sword. sword, like, punishing people. Yeah. Like, you know, not necessarily killing them, not all the time, but maiming them, for sure. Like, to say, like, okay, you've co co committed this sin, and so you don't do it ever again, I'm going to cut off your hand. Hammurabi or, shit. Yeah. You stole something from someone, I steal your hand. Mm hmm So it's, you know, so, but, like, his character juxtaposed with, like, Ryan Gosling's character, like... Pretty much on the same... Almost on the same path, because Ryan Gosling's brother was murdered as a consequence of raping and a, brutally murdering... A 16-year-old. A 14-year-old girl. And she was 16. So he wanted a 14. Oh, yeah, okay, that's right. Yeah, he goes to a whorehouse and asks for a 14-year-old and asks for the, like, runner of the whorehouse's, like, to go daughter. Get his daughter. Yeah. And he said no. So he, like, beats everyone in the freaking... Yeah, he trashes the place, gets kicked out. It cuts to him, like, his, with, like, you know, obviously he got roughed up and he's walking down the street, finds some, some dive whorehouse. And he gets a 16-year-old. And he, like, does what he does to her and then brutally kills her. Yeah. So when the Taiwanese inspector comes up, he lets her father slash pimp, you know, he asks him, well, why didn't you do anything? Why didn't you stop this? Why didn't you do anything about it? Well, or, yeah, why were you letting your daughter be a whore? Well, this that's before, no, before that. Oh. Like, and he's just like, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do whatever you want. And he just closes the door and walks away. Yeah. And while the father slash pimp, like, beats... And kills. Beats uh, Ryan Gosling's older brother to death with, like, a two-by-four. Or, like, a piece of a chair or something. Like, really nasty. It's a really nasty, it's like... It's a gory scene cut. once it's all said and well, done. Well, oh, because you only see the aftermath. You don't yeah. see the actual gore. You see shadows. And then it cuts back to, like, this dude's head just caved in. But this Taiwanese cop, has, like, his moral compass is weird because he's like, I said you could do anything. I didn't say you had to kill him. And also, I want to punish you for pimping out your daughters. Right. So he cuts off the dude's fucking hand in, like, this, like, parking lot somewhere. From, like, elbow down, too. Mm -hmm. So he never forgets his three other daughters. Yeah. So Ryan Gosling doesn't think that this guy unjustly killed his brother. He doesn't. Yeah, because he has the chance to kill him, and he doesn't. And then the mother's, like, pissed. She was like, why couldn't you do it? Yeah. Like, why didn't you, like, avenge your brother? She like, he would have avenged you. Yeah, and she says, like, if he did what he did, then he must have had his reasons. When, you know, Ryan Gosling tries to explain her, he fucking raped and killed a teenage girl. Like... I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Not gonna avenge chase that. chase down these people, um, but then it ends up being like this kind of light cat and mouse game between Ryan Gosling and the Taiwanese cop, and yeah, I mean that's where this whole idea of like Ryan Gosling, the whole family loyalty thing comes into play. Like he wants, he feels obligated to do something because of pressure from his mother, but he also doesn't want to do it, so he's kind of like half-assing it. Yeah, and she kind of sadistically ropes him back into it because she, like, says, like, take care of this, and I will take care of you like I should have. Like, I will be a mom to yeah, you. Yeah, I'll be a mother. And no, she's actually, not, and well, actually think... at that point, that's when he turns on her. No, I know, but I think he, like, in a moment was, like, you know, had that thought of her. Oh, yeah. Because then I think what drives that is when he finds her dead from the Taiwanese cop kills her, yeah. he, like, cuts into her womb, kind of, and, like, feels her womb. Which like... is a reference back to, like, these fantasies he has about like basically fingering this prostitute which he's not actually doing but it's also I think a reference to doubting the doubting Thomas story from the New Testament yeah oh yeah yeah about feeling her rib to make sure seeing if it's real yeah 
Because, I mean, the way she's... He's always... He just wants acceptance from her. Uh, sub, you know, however conscious or subconscious it is, he just wants to be accepted by her. So when she kind of dangles the idea of actually being a mother in front of him, I, yeah, he definitely entertains it. Almost goes through with it. Yeah, but he doesn't. But he doesn't and lets... What happens, happens. He lets the Taiwanese detective or muscle, cop muscle, whatever he is, kill his mother. I think he knows that. that that's what's happen. happening. Yeah. Because yeah. he, there's, you know, he goes to he goes to this guy's house, and is waiting for him to come home. And then his daughter comes home first, and the guy is with wants to kill the little girl because his mother said kill everybody. And he killed her and he, nanny. And he he kills the uh, the the other guy is with kills the nanny, and then goes to kill the daughter. And Ryan Gosling stops him. Kills him. Yeah. Shoots him a lot. But yes. then doesn't touch the little girl. And just leaves. Yep. <laughs> Here, you deal with this massacre, little one. <laughs> and then there's kind of, at the very end, and further to the point that, like, Ryan Gosling agrees with this Taiwanese detective or muscle or whatever, uh, and it's unclear whether this is a dream sequence or actually yeah. happening. The Taiwanese detective enacts the same type of justice he has enacted on other people by, like, cutting off their hands to Ryan Gosling. But you don't know if it's actually happening... Or if it's or a, if it's or if it's a dream, right? Because in the beginning of the movie, Ryan Gosling actually had visions of this happening to himself. Of yeah, of his arm being cut off. Of his arms being cut off, and the and this Taiwanese detective being the one to do it. So I'm not sure. That's the only part I felt was ambiguous and purposely so. I'm sure you know yeah. obviously, but um, and you kind of you take you extrapolate whatever you want from that, uh, whether it's actually happening or not. But it gives you a, a glimpse into where his mind is at, at the end. So you, it is a there is a catharsis there there is closure right because even whether it's happening real or, or in, the, in the dream world like or in a vision or whatever like it shows you his mental disposition you know what I mean yeah, yeah. Oh, I know what you're saying mm-hmm mm-hmm but what do you think of like people just kind of really hating it do you do you understand that or do you, can you see where people are coming from or I've heard the words like pretentious being thrown around uh, a lot I could kind of see that. And it might just be his style. I mean, kind of like with Drive. Drive, you know, it's like a lot of like, like you kind of said, like art house, like super imagery. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's really effective and sometimes it's not. Or like you kind of said, the ending was kind of like ambiguous. Yeah. And I think sometimes when movies are like that, that kind of scares people away or like confuses people and then they just turn on it to, as opposed of like... Because they don't want to take the effort to understand it because it wasn't spelled out for them? Yeah. yeah. I think that's what general public... That happens with some movies well, sometimes. Even, even like serious movie crowds, you know, like the review, the people that review films for a living and stuff like that, that was they had a very caustic reaction to the movie. I don't know why like, though. It's too, they said it's too slow and it's, it's. I thought it was paced fine. Overly pretentious. I think it's exactly what it wants to be. I think it has it. It accomplishes the goals that it sets it, that it sets out for itself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, it feels like a full cohesive experience. Yeah. It's not a bunch of half baked ideas thrown at the wall and they saw what stuck. You know what I mean? Like like a lot of art house movies are, where they just kind of throw imagery randomly and fucking shit everywhere just to see to like cause a reaction in its audience rather without purpose really. Mm -hmm. That doesn't like move its story forward. Mm -hmm. Like everything feels motiv like it's properly motivated. And I think it, like I was kind of saying, I think because you have to like it actually kind of makes you think about the modes of justice and like where everyone's intention is like it's not always super obvious it's kind of in the subtext yeah i just don't think people would give it enough t didn't give it enough time maybe yeah because that is kind of like the more i think about the movie the more i think about it. that's where the norma bates thing didn't hit me until i went to like i went upstairs to do something yeah. yesterday and i was like oh wow yeah you know kind of it's like subtle like slow fade in mm -hmm. and i think it matches the pace perfectly if you're patient enough with it I think so. I think yeah. And it right. was, but it wasn't so slow. Also, that it, it took my dis attention. It wasn't like, disengaging. No. And I think a lot of that has to do with the cinematography, how beautiful it is. Yeah. And how like how like aesthetically nice it is just to watch the movie. I think the colors were very effective in conveying mood. Oh, totally. Like all that red. All the red and the blue, like yeah. neon type colors, are really really prevalent in the movie, and um, and it's kind of like a demon face with the red that's always there. Yeah, it's it, you know, and like. Usually, it's, it's a dragon, but... It's a dragon, but it's also, I think, they're representative of, like, uh, violence and passion and, uh, and uh, kind of, like, it's there to represent kind of, like, this this warm, see seething, bubbling underneath. Yeah. Where, because, like, the other characters, like, his brother, there's a scene when he's in that first, like, 
whorehouse. It's blue. And it's all blue. And, like, there's a, He's red, there's though. a certain, like, apathy there. Like, the dude is so apathetic, he does not give a fuck. And I think, like, the actually the color blue, like, kind of sets you in that kind of mood. Like, this cool, stone cold... But he was red. The lighting on him was red. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, that's, like, a cool... No, it's cool. Very cool juxtaposition of colors and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it's a really beautiful movie to watch, so that's maybe a, partially the reason why I was never disengaged. Like I said, it's a co- it works as a whole. Yeah. The sum is better than its parts, probably, I guess, because the, the story's super anemic. It's so straightforward. Yeah. Um, there's not even a lot there. Like, Ryan Gosling probably has, like, maybe, like, ten lines of dialogue. I'm serious, there's not very no, much dialogue. He doesn't speak for the first, like, half hour. Yeah. <laughs> At all. See, that's why he was well, so good. Well, and that's, I think, it, like I said before, like, when we first started talking about it, it was like, this is something like Ryan Gosling being used correctly. Because I think... <laughs> not talking. Well, not just talking. I think what he's really good at is... Long stares. Into the soul. And, like, in, internal, <laughs> internal stuff. Yeah. Where, like, his, like, vacant stares and stuff like that convey more than, like, him saying a piece of dialogue could. He's really good at making you think that there are cogs turning in his head, I think. In my opinion. Uh, and it's no, I mean, and I mean that over the it's past all, over all, the past few years. It's all in the eyes. Like if you go for saying something like a place beyond the pines and dri- drive, and now uh, only God forgives. I think those are movies where he's showing his maturity as a performer. Yeah. And like, because I as think as opposed to think Gangster he, Squad. Th- yeah, that was, that was just a bad movie. Nobody's good in Gangster Squad, but like, I don't know. I think like he got a lot of attention when he first his first like kind of. Breakout, like as far as acting goes, was Half Nelson. Yeah, and it's a really histrionic performance. It's not really. It's just like that movie got a lot of attention because of the political subtext of the movie. And it's he's overrated in that movie, so I think he got a lot of attention because of it because he got nominated for an Academy Award and stuff like that, probably unjustly. Mm-hmm. And I think people put on him like a, a, a preconception that he's more talented than he actually was at the time. Yeah. Like, you know, he's a child actor. He's fucking, he's growing up Mickey getting, Mouse Club. And getting better. Like, all actors, I imagine, you know? Like, you grow up, you yeah, get better. Yeah, don't say Half Nelson was his first acting gig. It was the Mickey Mouse Club. No, I didn't. Thank you no, very I said much. His first, Singing songs with his Justin Timberlake. first acting gig of, like, I'm prevalence. Jo- like, I think, you know, who's another good example of that? Like, Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger was kind of a vanilla, like, whatever actor until, like, the last couple years of his life. Don't talk about ten things I hate about you like that. <laughs> but he's not like a stand. Doesn't stand out. I like. know that's a terrible movie. <laughs> the Taming of the Shrew. You mean? Um, Taming of the High School Marching Band. Yeah. Yeah, but overall, like I don't know. I think it's totally well worth people's time if you're into movies and you're into something a little bit more adventurous, maybe as far as like artsy fartsy stuff. And you don't really mind blood. You. you don't mind moments of extreme violence. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it. I digs it. Um, yeah, so that's gonna do it for Only God Forgives. Can we take one more moment to reflect on Ryan Gosling? Yes, we can. A moment of silence, if you please. Mm. Mm -mm. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm sorry. Uh, so the last thing we're gonna talk about is something that uh, I'd heard about a while ago, making rounds in festivals, a documentary, The Act of Killing. I had never heard about it till you said something. Yeah. It was awesome. It's, um... Or as you would say, wicked awesome. I think it's actually, like, borderline... I, and I hate throwing around this word when it comes to movies or art or anything important. Uh, because I think it kind of transcends just being a documentary, just being a movie, because you are getting a glimpse into a side of human nature and the and way... And history. And, and history and the way... Well, I mean, it's, it's more about the fallout of history, but... I think it's as a, a as a character studies and like a, a piece about like sociology or in psychology the inner workings of people. Mm. It's something that you very rarely ever get to see, because usually in movies like in, or in interviews you get to see with serial killers and stuff like that they've been caught. And they've been told what they've done is wrong. They're perpetrators. Right. Right? The people in this documentary, these these, these death Kill- squads, yeah, these death killers, squads. these murderers, from like, you know, they murdered like 2.5 million people within two years in 1965, 1967. Yeah. Like these uh, alleged communists, because the government, the powers that be, wanted to overthrow it. So what they did is they hired a bunch of the local gangsters and mafia and stuff like that to 
create work, these work squads. Work his muscle and work his death squads and basically made them part of the and military, part of the police, part of the structure. Part of the political structure. And a lot of those people are still in power. They took it, they're still there. And the rest of them, kind of the murder squads, they're looked at kind of as folk heroes. They're like very, heroes, yeah. very proud of what they did. They have like these very odd justifications and stuff like that. And the way, as the movie unfolds, like you get to hear about just the sadism. The inner workings, yeah. But also, like... And like you, and the the filmmaker asked these these people to reenact what they did, and show him how they did it, and like basically make a movie. He, he kind of appealed to their egos, so they would they would speak openly about things and candidly. Yeah. And when you and I think this documentary was filmed like over like six seven years, so like once they were like towards the last like third of the movie, especially like there's like they capture some really powerful moments of like realization. And discussion and and like and you can see the like these walls they've built in their minds of like how they justify their actions kind of start to crack. Yeah, especially with Congo. There's this the guy the main basically the main subject of the documentary is Anwar Congo. Yeah. He's the most open, and he's the most uh, torn about it. I think. Yeah, and towards the end you see that. Yeah, he's and like, you can even see just in the way he carries himself is a lot different. His demeanor changes. And he, th I think it was really cool. They show these scenes of him sleeping, and I thought that was really neat because he slowly starts to talk about how they do kind of these killings like haunt him. Yeah. At night. And as you go, like it's actually uh, they make a point to show you. I think you know, like that he becomes increasingly more restless in his sleep. Yep. As he's kind of going through this experience of having to relive relive these. Because when, yeah, when he starts with the reenactments, like, you see this kind of, like, old excitement in him. Yeah. No, there is that first. It's yeah, he's, like, he's especially like, talking about, people. like, showing him how he strangled people, like the, the people in the American movies did, all the gangsters in the yeah. American movies. Because yeah. that's what they're kind of basing their behavior off of, is they were the, the movie theater gangsters. Yeah, because they would scout tickets. So, yeah, they would scout tickets, and then... And then their impetus to get involved with the movement... No, go ahead. No, was the fact that these quote unquote communists or the Commonwealth wanted to ban American movies, but American movies were so successful in the area, that's where these gangsters made all their money. Yep. So it was like very fucking petty shit, and that's why they were so like uh, readily readily got involved. I guess, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, and then to see like the factions they're a part of too, like the leaders and like how like the one the main leader of the one group yeah. he just goes golfing. Mm -hmm. And like you know, and they have pretty normal lives. But yeah, and they still to this day like the one scene was really interesting too when they were taught they were like interrogating a com a man who like told his story about how his stepfather was killed for being a communist and he remembers it and he starts getting upset and then like they do this interrogation scene with him. And well, the next well the ne yeah that's like the next scene is like an you, you don't realize he's an actor like you right. don't know what he is when he's talking about like his his story about how his stepfather was murdered. Right. Um, you don't know what he is in context of this group. Right. And then you realize, and then they start doing this interrogation scene, and it starts, like, blending in, like, what you feel is maybe real. Yeah, because at one moment you look at me, you're like, you know this isn't, like, for the, this isn't really, like, a fake yeah. interrogation. This is real. And I was like, yeah. Like, it felt so mm -hmm. real, and the way he was, like, reacting and the way they were acting was, like, yeah, and the, so intense. Like, because I guess that must have been like their rehearsal because they all had scripts in their back pockets and like headphones on, like the DP and stuff like that. So, and but the guy was selling it to such a degree, like I thought they were actually going to kill him, going to kill him because they could get away with it. First of all, and second of all, because well, he it's had just sort like, of like a communist cent or quote unquote communist communist family. Yeah, but like, and these guys talk so plainly, like, plain speak about the things that they do and about killing people that when they're talking about killing him, quote-unquote, and torturing him, like, it doesn't seem out of place. It no. seems just as real as everything else. Right. Uh, and that was, like, that's when the documentary, I think, really got its claws into me, because that was, like, within the first, like, 40 minutes of the movie. And it w we saw a version that was, w two hours, 40 minutes? Yeah, yeah, because the theatrical run of the movie is... Is uh one hour or 115 minutes. So we saw basically the director's cut. My favorite also was the large gangster that dressed up like a woman. The divine. Yeah, the, I call him the divine of the gangsters. Yeah. Well, the, and the, also the thing about. And then he ran for the workers' party. Yeah, some workers' parliament, I guess they called it. Yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, and he wanted to do it just so he could shake down the communities. Yeah, he he had more control over a couple neighborhoods where there'd be like ten thousand communists supposedly. Or not even communists. And then you show but, them no. shaking down store owners. No, it wasn't that... about communists because it's even still to this day, if you're a communist, if you're you come out as a communist, yeah, they'll kill you. Yeah, that's people who live in just fear. This is in Taiwan, by the way. Indonesia. Indonesia. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Indonesia. My South apologies. Kumatra or North Kumatra? Kumatra. I okay. I believe. Um, Sorry. But yeah, like it's. I got the two movies confused for a second. But it's crazy because this movie has like the audacity to humanize evil. And I watched an interview with the director, and the director said, like, he's like, there is a difference in like the way when you describe a person. Like, there's a way, two different ways, approaches to like describe them an evil human being or a human being who has done evil things. And there's an important distinction there. There is. Because there's no such thing as monsters. Like, there isn't. There's there's no such thing as pure, unadulterated evil. It's just not there. Like, just like these guys, th- there's always a, a justification for it. Like, people don't engage in this stuff without thinking they're right. Right. You know, even Hitler thought he was right. However fucked up the justifications are, yeah, that's one thing. And it's because it doesn't you, make them any l- less wrong. And it, well, it's because you convince yourself of something. So, like, it was actually, this reminds me of a passage I was reading the other day. Where, you know, if you want to come off as benevolent and friendly, you become so benevolent and friendly that it overtakes you. Yeah. And so, the, by these guys trying to embody, like, being the gangsters and, like, the hard asses that they admired so through cinema, they became them. And there's not no room for anything else because that is your controlling way and want. Yeah, they're living in. And a so fantasy. it comes. It, it's a fantasy, but it also comes into your sense of being. So it's how you of, identify. How you identify, and so there is no right or wrong inherently. You know what I mean in yeah. that sense. It's no, not there like, isn't. Yeah, it's, no, it's, it's, I'm not being evil. You know, I'm going to be evil. Going back to what I was, the word I was struggling to find before, the relativity of morality. Yes. And justice. It's. They are relative things to different cultures. Yep. You know, our social mores are not have no bearing on the social mores of other countries. You know what I we mean? Think like they as, do. As, as we we impose them on other countries for sure. We definitely do. Because we are obviously righteous. I thought you were gonna say right and I was gonna laugh. <laughs> no, I mean like like well I meant that sarcastically, we're obviously righteous. Because yeah. like I mean there's this idea that like our morality is so Progressive that we have the right to dictate what other people's morality should be in other societies and cultures. I don't think that's entirely fair. No. Or right to do. Um, and it gets us into a lot of uh, situations and problems that like, we all feel as a country because of it. Because we're talking about like systematic beliefs that have been prevalent for thousands of years sometimes. Yep. You know. Um, and also another aspect I, I thought was really, really interesting is that like going back to what you said about like how they engage the movies of their time for ideas um, and how to act and look and dress and and uh, the sadist actually inspiration for further their sadism um, is that like thanks Al Pacino like the those movies that inspired them at the time like informed their reality right right like you said but I also think it's really really interesting that when they started making a movie about what they were doing Mm -hmm. like then that's when it actually the reality of the situation was actually driven home for them right it was more real than reality than actually doing it right because movies had such a a hold over their perception right that like when they did a movie and they did all the reenacted all the horrible things they did it actually started making them realize how horrible it was and they actually got to the point where some scenes they were like okay we're done well, yeah, really Anwar. Anwar Congo couldn't even handle getting through a scene where he played a torture victim. Yeah. He couldn't do it. And that's kind of like the... And it's that happens towards the end of the movie because it is the big moment of revelation. Right. Where he actually feels guilt in a real way. And he's not trying to justify it anymore because he feels like this experience has let him empathize with his victims. Which is an, a unique opportunity, and that's why it's such a unique documentary. Maybe we should most... just start putting serial killers and stuff into movies. <laughs> yeah, and have them reenact what they did. So, Charlie Manson. Yeah. No, I don't no, think Charlie Manson's too crazy. I'm joking. So that's the thing about these people, they're not crazy. 
I know. They're pretty eloquent, well spoken. There's even one of one of uh, Anwar Congo's like buddies that shows up like. You talking about the one that takes his family to the mall? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He shows up about an hour into the movie. Is fully aware of what he's doing. What, 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 he, did. what he did. Like even to the point to call it sadism. Like the other people, they will not call it. They're not. We're not sadistic. Like right. Even though they were, I mean, because they unnecessarily like tortured people to death. They didn't just kill them; they tortured them to death. Yeah. Like a lot of times, and did it with a lot of glee and righteousness. Yep. And, uh, and he but even he's, calls it war. He's like, you know, like well, that's how he justifies. He justifies it by like war. Yeah. Even though it's not, it wasn't a war. It was a manhunt. Yep. Like it was just the. Uh, but that's how he. The sh- red scare. But he recognizes it as a justification. Yep. He said, you have to tell yourself things to be able to get through the day. You have to convince yourself sometimes of things. And that's like, it's it's startling, it's shocking. It's an it's incredibly shocking movie. And again, um, it was so long, but I like was never, yeah. my interest was never deterred. Well, because we always, like, you know, we talk about this kind of stuff, like the relativity morality and stuff like that a lot. But, like, it, it's very rarely we ever get to take those these concepts out of the abstract. Right. You know, it's one thing to sit there and discuss social mores and justifications in the context of like a classroom and academic sense, and then to actually see it. See it is kind of is powerful. It is. It's like it's a, the most important movie I've maybe seen ever or in a very long time. It had a profound effect on me. It did. I mean, these are things I've always thought about, and I always understood these concepts. Right. The banality of evil. Um, or that nobody, there's no such thing as monsters is something that I really believe. Even when it comes to like recent events like the Boston bombings and that kid and stuff. Uh, the one that's a surviving brother. Like, he's not a monster. Like, he's a human being. Like, you need to put him into perspective to understand what would make a person do something like that to ever change anything. But people just don't, don't. have time for that. It's like either you're good or you're bad sometimes. And the way, especially the way the media portrays things, uh, it gets. It's kind of ridiculous, and it sells everybody. It's, it's kind of talking down to you, treats you like a child, and doesn't. It's not decent enough to let you make your own decisions. Right. Um, which is another aspect of this film too: is how society is reacted, or social society, or uh, the like media and things like that. How they've used it. Yeah, because they show some interviews with them in their homeland, and it's like all propaganda. It's all propaganda. Yeah. Very They even talk about like the propaganda they, films. And they all know it's propaganda. Yeah. And because even to even further, any like rally that they have where there's large crowds and stuff like that, every single one of those people is paid to be there. Mm-hmm. Fucking incredible. Like they are living in a facade, they know it, and they do not care. <laughs> it's crazy. It is crazy. It, it was, is. And it's crazy to like when you watch it. Like the rallies and stuff. Yeah. Or I, I think the moment that hit me most was when they were talking about the propaganda film they played in the schools. Yeah. And how they make the younger ones sit up front, and as you get older, you move back in the theater. Yeah. So it becomes so instilled in you from such a young age yeah. that it's like, you don't question it. No, exactly. It's this crazy is... to me. But the thing, even about that, though, like when they when the, like, when the Death Squad guys are discussing the, the propaganda film, they're totally aware that it's propaganda. No, I know. Like, there's they're like... There's communist women never like ran around dancing naked, and there was no evil. They're not mon- They weren't monsters, and blah blah blah. Like, yeah, they, they say that. They know that, but they're like it's so important for people to think that to be able to again justify their behavior and to justify their feelings towards yep. it. Yep. It's, it's fucking that movie just blew, blew my mind. I, I not, watch it again soon. I had not ever. I, I haven't had my mind blown in a, from like a movie or a documentary since I was like fourteen. Wow. Just because I didn't know shit back then. And even though, like I said, I was aware of these things, and this kind of reinforces a lot of my personal beliefs about about humanity, yep. about human nature, it's still shocking to see it actually there. Because like I said, it's not abstract anymore. It's a real tangible thing. Sorry to yawn. It's okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking about Ryan Gosling. So yeah, I mean, like, what, do you, what did you... Th- I mean, who would you recommend this movie to? I mean, I'd recommend it to anybody. But, like, say, what's the barrier for entry as far as, like, age? Age? Like, a pro- age appropriate for something like this. I'd say, like, 15. Yeah, I was going to say, like, 15 or maybe, like, late teens. And it, only because of how gruesome it gets at points. 
And also, like, the density of the subject, subject matter. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, like, early teens and on. I'd say, yeah, because once you get into high school, you start getting becoming aware of justifications and social dynamics yep. and how those kind of things work, and I think, and, like, you know, bullies and shit like that. You know, once you've had enough time to live through a little bit of it, have some type of context and perspective, I think something like this would be awesome. Like, yep. something that should be watched in schools and stuff like that. I think it's a little politically pandering to... Because even it does kind of betray its own conceit sometimes because it's like communist good, this regime bad at points. Mm -hmm. um, not directly or anything like that, but there's definitely that is a little bit prevalent there. Um, and it kind of doesn't really address the fact a lot that these a lot of the people they killed weren't actually communists. They were just kind of enemies they had. Yeah. Uh, they were just kind of indiscriminately killing Chinese people. Oh, yeah. Um, because this movie does not give you much historical background. It gives you what you need to know for context to what you're about to watch, and that's it. It does not delve into any depth. And I don't... It didn't need to, either. Like, just the... I mean, that's something you can just look into yourself, you know? Mm-hmm. But, yeah, anyways, I don't know. Really, really loved it. I did, too. I'll probably watch it again next couple days. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it's it's super. It, like I said, it's dense and it's worth rewatching. And because the first time you watch and, it, and some of the imagery is really pretty. Oh, it's beautifully shot too. Yeah, for a documentary. Yep. And because a lot of the, and you can tell like not much of this was premeditated. Like as far as shot compositions and things like that, this is very like fly on the wall at times. Yep. And uh, it's really really great. Uh, yeah. So that's a definite recommend for me. Me too. Yeah, it's like if you can go out support this film, buy it when it comes out in Blu-ray. If you get, if the local and video on demand, like rent it. If it's playing in a local theater, go see it. Like it's worth it's worth your time. It's worth supporting something like this because it's a small grassroots film. You know, like it could have if if Errol Morris and Werner Herzog had not picked this up at festival, you probably wouldn't have be hearing about it. Right. I mean, the right, uh, you know, the right, Errol Morris, of course, like, big documentary filmmaker he has been for a long time, Werner Herzog, crazy German yeah, say director, crazy. <laughs> uh, who's also made some fantastic documentaries himself, and, um, and, yeah, if it wasn't for them, like, I, this movie could have fallen by the wayside very, very easily, so I'm thankful that it got picked up. Um, yep. And it's going to be distributed and stuff because it's it's really 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 powerful, really really important I think, and it's it, it's unique. I've never seen something that is this candid or this in depth about this type of subject matter. Because you learn the history while you're seeing other like future time unfold. Because mm -hmm. it was a part of history I wasn't really aware of. Me neither. Yeah, I didn't. I I knew about it. No, but you know what I mean? I wasn't, yeah. like, super, you know... And it, so yeah. to learn something from the past, but then to see how it's unfolded into the future and present is... Yeah. Really, how it's directly affected yeah, their it's present really, regime it's really and lifestyles. It's really compelling. Yeah. Really, really fantastic. Well, I think that's going to about do it for us today, Sarah. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Unless we have something else to blather on about. Not really. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so thanks for listening, everybody. Um, yep. Actually, why don't you give out... Uh, what's your Twitter handler, Sarah? Ah, uh, it is... Rhyme scheme. At rhyme scheme. Yeah, at rhyme scheme. At rhyme scheme. Mine is at natural underscore, underscore gamers. That's what it is. Follow uh, us. Yeah, you can follow us, and you can hear us some Chat. of our uh, our funny things, and always be able to keep up to date with this podcast and articles on the site. Wow, we're getting really good at self promoting. Yeah, gotta plug your shit. Ugh. Plug it. Plug it up. Plug it up. So why don't you plug it up and we'll end this thing. All right, goodbye. Bye.